Hey team, sit back, relax and enjoy. We are in our fifth episode, I believe, of the Rugby League Lounge weekly show. As you can see, I'm in a bit of a different venue on my way for a course. So thank you everyone that has been interacting within our polls this week. Our top 10 list me and Rugby League modern day prints have been slamming them home and also been doing the knockout tournament with the most popular team in the NRL. So it's been really good for you guys to interact with that. Um, yeah, as I've kind of apologised in my story, I haven't been able to kind of do a contrast or variety of different content because I've been so busy. So I thought it'd be a good week to kind of smash together some top 10 list um, because everyone is asking for it such things and also um it's coming to the yeah it's getting really really close to the uh, start of the season so we've got some other stuff coming up i'm going to be doing um another lineup for the start of feb i won't spoil it too much but i'll kind of do a little bit of a hint of one of the selections coming up um with one of these questions um because i was asked about a certain situation by one of the players that's involved so yeah, so thanks again for all the questions, guys. Um, yeah, I was a bit nervous I wasn't going to find time to do this or the situation to, you know, get this in. Um, but, yeah, thanks once again for the questions. Now, a lot of these questions actually either have contrasted from have very similar to previous questions or actually posts that I've done in the future. So I will reference every question and then I will might not cover it but i'll kind of tell you you know how you can access my um thoughts on that selection um so anyway bryce.mo one um always sending in some great questions and he's asked your favorite queensland team my one is 2006. awesome bryce obviously the team that started the dynasty off um and yeah i started watching in 2009 so even though i feel like i've witnessed a good chunk of the dynasty i didn't really get to see the start of it and um i thought you were quite a young fella too so you might have missed it too but obviously there's some great stars in that and you can go back and watch youtube highlights so that's cool that that's your favorite team um mine probably is the first year i started watching um billy slater israel falau great english first and luckier uh, Petro was there, you had Kevin Smith, very much that core was there, you had other guys, I'm just trying to think some fillers, oh, I shouldn't say fillers, but Justin Hodges, you had Nate Miles, and yeah, probably a lot of the reasons was just because that reason hits home with me, because that's when I first started watching, and even though there's been better versions of Billy Slater, better versions of First and better versions of Greg Inglis, they were... Um, they weren't raw talents like obviously they were quite well-rounded they had been playing top level rugby league for a while but they still had the sense of athleticism about them good for a couple of mistakes but probably made it a little bit probably more exciting to watch maybe yes yeah, obviously they were successful you know that was their fourth year on the trot winning but as complete footballers they were better um later on in terms of highlights, that's what I'll put their peak. And also, um, yeah, that was the year Jared Hayne did that famous run down the sideline and was a controversial no try as well. I mean, that was my first ever origin game I watched. Everyone forgets some great tries from that series. I mean, Billy Slater saw, scored two tries in particular. One was the first try of the series when he got the ball down just for the dead ball line. And there was a similar one later on with Greg Inglis kicked it to him and he did a pretty difficult put down as well. And also Inglis did a spectacular try too, around a good 60 odd metres to score. Um, absolutely um, speared past the fullback and completely disappeared my memory who the fullback was at the time. I don't think it was Brett Stewart. And then Chilo was during that kind of injury period there. So... Yeah, it's gonna bug me now. Might be Kirk Goodley. Could have been Kirk Goodley. So yeah, really enjoyed that team. Um, some other contenders. Um, I probably would ultimately say 2012, but Billy Slater, my favorite player, wasn't a part of that game three squad. But that's probably my favorite series one. Now that's a completely different question. But that game, 2012, game three, is my favorite game of all time. By quite a, a big margin. It was just epic. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't ultimately go off that side because. Billy was not um, a part of it. But yeah, talking about Billy, probably 20, 
18 as well, um, especially game three, because he got the captain to side and go out a winner. And controversially, did win the Wally Lewis medal. Um, yes, probably shouldn't have got it, but if you look at the system they did it, he deserved it from that system. But yeah, I disagree that he was the best player that series. It should have been a James Disco. Um, and trying to think of anyone else. Um, Hardest team to predict this year and underrated and overrated players. Now, Cooper, we did a hardest team to predict post earlier in um, this month, I believe. So scroll down, it's a top five list, and you will see my reasoning. It won't go from my reasonings, but I think I've had the Cowboys, Manly, I had Newcastle, New Zealand Warriors, and then the Panthers as my hardest team to predict. And underrated, overrated players. Underrated, I did an underrated lineup in December. So have a look, scroll down on my feed, and you'll see all my selections. And you'll also see the fans selected a team as well. So yeah, get on board with that. Um, and overrated, look, I I know I asked you guys a question, overrated players. I probably threw you guys a bit under the bus there, so I apologize. I try not to overrate players to, yeah, put that claim overrated because like our follower Fishbowl Prive, he said David Fafita was overrated, but looking back at it, he kind of overrated him due to his contract. Now, I don't overrate players due to the contract because at the end of the day, that's not the decision. That's what the club has kind of put their value at, if that makes sense. So if you want to get a bit of a glimpse of who I think is overrated. Maybe look at my top 10 list that I've obviously been putting up with Rugby League Modern Day Prince. And probably think guys that maybe I've missed out that you'd think, hmm, they should be um, on the list. So trying to think of one in particular. Obviously, I've got still the forwards to do um, now. Um, I think Jerome Lulai, I have a bit, bit lower than, uh, I should say, yeah, about six or seven in the in the 5-8 category where people might have bumped them up. I think it's just because of the sample size and I believe the teams will be able to figure out the Panthers out a bit better this year. Um, because I had like Dylan Brown ahead of him where people like Lula's had a better year than Brown and obviously they made the grand final. Um, but I've just liked what Brown can do more as your number one option and I like him as a complimentary player. And even um, though it was his first proper season, his rookie season, he really showed me some great glimpses too. And even though, yeah, it's not great sample sizes to kind of compare, but I've just seen a bit more from Brown. And it's not potential. I just, for some reason, yeah, Brown just does it for me. He's got this, they both got the swag about them. There'll be two very interesting players to look at side by side on as their careers progress so Jerome Lulai could be one um Anthony Blake is in my props he's probably a bit lower props is really hard because there's guys that gain heaps of meters heaps of offloads but a good foot year is um as well or maybe yeah players that can kind of affect the team in a negative way but then you have guys like Jesse Bromwich Christian Welch who I mean who am I naming off oh, I wonder Melbourne Storm players so there's a bit of a trend there, um, guys that maybe yeah, their numbers don't screw off the um, off the paper, but consistently their numbers are high level. So for me, that was really hard to value. And ultimately, just a bit of a sneak preview, I did go a bit on the numbers and impact, um, especially when you think you it's hard to value if the Melbourne's getting the best out of them. Um, is the systems what making them effective or... Can they go away and deliver elsewhere? And if they're out of that system, would they be putting up similar numbers to the guys, you know, putting up the up the ranks in the media eating numbers and all sorts of offloading numbers? Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, Jerome Lulai is probably one that maybe I tend to think people have jumped the gun on a bit. Um, trying to think who else off the top of my head. Alex Johnson, in the sense that he's a great try scorer, but I put like Blake Ferguson in that ahead of him still because even though he had a down season, there's a sample size. I, you know, I prefer the track record of Blake Ferguson over Johnson. Plus, 
bit of meter like he's more well-rounded i believe he can impact the game differently now alex johnson is not really known for taking the hard yards and that's why even i'm a big storm fan big josh Adakar fan but why i was but he's in from as a number one winger for a long time was even though he was the number one guy i wanted in open space can he affect the game like we've just mentioned like can he be an extra forward at times and provide maybe a bit of a different element but because he's beefed up because he's just improved on his defense improved on like just positional play and all sorts that's why josh adekar has him in himself as i believe the best one of game if not if you don't believe it these are definitely top three um so yeah oh yeah so um, I might do a post later on about overrated, but maybe change my delivery of it. Maybe guys, I don't value as high as others and why I believe that. Um, you've also asked coaching positions at risk. Um, Josh, we've kind of touched on this, but Josh Morris is one of a lot that has to do with injury in a situation he's been put in since being there. Um, Nave, um, so um, the Eels coach, Brad Arthur, because... It just seems to be each year is the same same thing. Obviously, they had that wooden spoon year as well, but, yep, they can get to the top four, but when it comes to the finals, that's their ceiling. They just drop off. They don't have that extra gear yet, and maybe it's just what they think is needed is the coaching change. You have Maz McGuire, who, you know, is probably similar to Brad Arthur in the sense that a good coach, works them hard, but maybe it's just that repeated formula. Yes, it's getting you you know, maybe to a certain tier, but you're just not getting to that next level and potentially being at another coaching will, you know, get that out of them. So I think they're the three guys I think of, to be honest. Um, Off the top of my head, can't think of anyone else. <clears throat> so I actually just picked up a bit of a cough in my, cough in my throat. Um, Rapidly Modern Day Prints, like I said, check out our top 10 list I've been doing with Rapidly Modern Day Prints and where you can vote on our story too. And I think he would probably be 50 50. I probably should have been posting the results up um, of who's been polling more, but I've been a bit, like I've said, I've been busy man. Busy man to my standards anyway. So, do Souths have the most stacked side in recent history um, in, in recent seasons, I should say? Yeah, and this is probably more like applying like on paper. Um, I'd have to say, no, I think that when I saw that Rooster side in 20, even last 2019, yeah, because they still had Cooper Cronk there, yeah, Tedesco, um, and why they'd probably out, when you talk about being stacked, why they have them above the year before, they added Angus Crichton, even though he didn't have a great year coming into that season, it's like he's just come off the back of arguably being one of the best second rowers in the comp from the previous year. So for me, that Roosters side sticks out. Even that Roosters side was up 2013. They'd come 15th and they won the next year. And a lot of it was to do with the acquisitions they added. Sonny Bill, Michael Jennings. They also added, um, Jay, did I say James Maloney? James Maloney. And, but I think at the time, maybe not because looking back, you think that they also had RTS, Boyd Corner. But they kind of, yeah, we're surprised in the sense that as young players, we didn't think they were going to contribute. We obviously know now how valuable they are, but yeah, they probably didn't seem stacked because we didn't realise what those players could be. Even at a young age, they were effective. Like, I think Sheik and Boy Corner got their position awards for the Dallin M. So that just shows how great they were as well. So, but for me, it's probably the 2018 Sydney Roosters side takes the cake um, i'm trying to think who else obviously storm sides have been good but and you've always had rep players around that main main three of billy cronk uh, billy cronk and kevin smith but um yeah in terms of like it being the star talent being spread out yeah the rooster side is more spread out um for me, so I'd probably have to go off the Roosters side, but yeah, the Rabbitohs side definitely looks like the most stacked side this season, yeah, but hey, you know, will that, will that mean a premiership? Doesn't always mean the case. I'm trying to think of a stacked team that didn't end up going all the way um, after having so much um, maybe hype because of their team. Um, should have thought about this earlier. I'm trying to think of a stacked team that didn't quite 
reach their heights. Yeah, no, it's escaped me. Can't think of any off the top of my head. Uh, maybe I'll actually post that as a question and maybe post my thoughts. Actually, it's going to be homework for me. Uh, make a super team up that kind of didn't hit the heights that they were predicted to. So, yeah, we'll move on. Um, and Goons kicked, we kind of touched on this too. Goons kicks us, Water Broncos come back from such a SHIT year and end in top eight. I don't think they will. I don't think they will either, mate. But honestly, I've talked about this a bit, but everyone's getting high on the teams that have added in players that are outside the top eight. Dogs, Titans, Warriors. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if it's one of these teams like the Dragons, like the Broncos. It's a team I haven't really thrown up, but hey, Kiwi Walters, he's not an X and O's coach. He is a culture coach. He's gone in there to kind of get back that Bronco identity. And even though that might not mean they're throwing out the best like players in the world and that, but just a sense of belief might do a lot. Like you got to remember, they still finished in the top eight the year before, and a lot of their success can go down to, I think if they are to make the eight, Milford has to be their most impactful player. I believe you're gonna get you're gonna get what you're gonna get out of Haas, but at the end of the day, he's only 21. Um, you've got, even though Fafita's left, there's some great young talent in there. There is um, yeah, Tony Stagg, who I believe is contending for one of the best centres in the game. Jordan Ricky is a good young talent as well. You've got players there. And also the acquisition of John Asiata. We talk about ball playing locks. That's him to a T. So maybe he can really change how they play and can really unlock something for the Brisbane side. So yes, at this stage they are not on my eight. I haven't been a team though I have been looking at of late and thinking, is it is it more likely wooden spoon or is more likely that kind of ninth tenth position? And I think we're probably going to get a sense of that really early on to see how far they have come since last year's disastrous season um yeah so we're almost wrapped up here i'll just get to a question from ned who basically um has asked he wrote dm me so sorry if it's not right there on my phone he asked me about the rts situation and the rts will be one of my players selected for this upcoming squad so expect your fallback to be rts and yeah obviously it's about him going to rugby union now it's sad for um the Warriors, obviously he's been there and there's not much bad to say about him. Obviously they've only made one final series appearance, but with that with that one season, he got a Dally M and he got them to their first final since 2011. That is huge. I still remember round one of 2018, he made that awesome tackle on Alex Johnson. It was the tackle of the year, I believe. And just he got up and he was just hyped. This is round one of the season. In a neutral venue too, where it's not like your crowd is there to pump you up. It was in Perth, I believe, or got the yeah, or Central Coast, something like that. The energy he brought it just spoke a lot. And they remember when they scored tries, they'd get in the huddle and they'd do the breathing. Just to calm down, just control their thoughts. And that, so even though he's bringing like talent on the field in spades, it's the culture, it's the effort, it's the accountability he's bringing. He has changed what the Warriors are about. This, and then we saw it in full space this season, winning the captain of the year, probably one of the first captain of the years to be won by a player that didn't make the eight. Normally you see it because their team has either overachieved or they've consistently been the best team all year. They didn't make the eight, and a lot of that was to do, and a lot of his captain of the year run was to do with just him being able to motivate his his team because of the situation they'll put him due to COVID. And even though it, it looked like it was going to get to a pretty dark place, especially after Cooney being sacked, but he they ended up getting the 10th and they only dropped out of the top eight contention probably, I think it was the Eels game, which was only a few games left. So he's really brought so much to this team and I'll touch on a bit more later in my post, but a lot of the times he's asked to do too much where he thinks, we think, now, is he even a top 10 player? I think it's just sometimes he's been asked to be 
you know, being the top meter eater in the game, which has impacted, you know, his ability to break games open. So, yeah, it's, but let's talk about his prospects for the All Blacks. You know, he's, he's given him a realistic chance to make the squad. If he joins over there in 2022, the World Cup is in 2023. So he's got two years, two seasons to do it. And can he do it? I don't know what position he'll play because obviously he's got the a kicking game. But there's, the midfield isn't sorted out for the All Blacks. So he's got the ability there to be a midfielder. Obviously, there will be positional kind of things he has to work out as well. So I could see midfield being his spot. It could be a fullback or could be a, a roaming winger as well. And, you know, you don't have to be the best kicker to be a winger. Obviously, it's a skill, you know, you'd love to have. But it, it can be done without. So... Yes, I do think there's a good chance he could be there. And similar to Sonny Bill went over there and brought this different kind of X factor and um, different kind of aura about him as well. And maybe he can actually, even though the All Blacks are such a prestigious organisation and team, they're going through a bit of a funk at the moment, to be fair, to our standards. Similar to when Sonny Bill come in, when they just the last World Cup was that French disappointment in the quarterfinals. They can come in and probably, you know, it's hard to say, but teach this great organisation a few things about, you know, culture, leadership, um, a few things that maybe the All Blacks hadn't thought about. You know, um, he can bring a lot to the All Blacks, but yeah, he's got to show that he can transition to rugby, and I don't doubt that he can, but will it be enough to ultimately earn a spot? Um, we'll have to wait and see. But I'm excited for Roger Tuivasa Sheik, and even though I'm sad as a rugby league fan, I'm excited for him as as a fan of him to kind of take this opportunity, you know, take a take a risk and achieve probably a, a huge goal of his as well. So yeah, very exciting times for Sheik. Um and that's me guys. Thank you very much for listening. Like I said, appreciate all the support. And yeah, be uh, um tune in for the rest of the week and I'll be back next week for what will be our six weekly show. Cheers guys.